Hi, I'm Dr. Stephanie McWilliams. I am a faculty member in the psychology department, a clinical faculty member. I run the graduate training clinic for our graduate students who are earning their doctoral degrees in the psychology department. Um, I also do a lot of undergraduate teaching in the psychology department as well. I've been at WVU for about six years now. My primary area of research is mentorship. And I'm Jay Malarche, uh, pronounced the French way because I'm from New Orleans. Uh, I am a uh, theater historian, literary criticism teacher in the School of Theater and Dance. Uh, my primary research area is comedy. Uh, and what else did you say about your? Oh, I teach graduate and undergraduate, all that stuff. Uh, but what we're doing today is a little bit um, more specific to the 191 class that I think everybody here is in charge of a section or two. Uh, so we're going to give you some of the tips. I taught this class years ago when I was a riffle at Summit. And um, I got a lot out of the class, and I think the way I engineered the class then, the students did too. And this is sort of part of what that experience taught me. And Stephanie, did you, you wanted to start because the mentoring yep. psychology part Yeah, so, your, you know, whether you're teaching for the first time or you've taught many times before, there's, there's always new things to learn, mm -hmm. right? So we, we wanted to start off with, you know, why are you here? Why are you being trained? You know, many of you probably have taught before, but... Hopefully, uh, you know, as we move through our careers, there's always new little things we like to pick up or steal from other people. So um, we wanted to start off with some ideas that have worked for us or have not worked for us. Sometimes those are better stories to share um, that maybe you can utilize in, in your teaching. So there's always something new to learn, right? That's kind of what we're working on. Um, support and guidance. Who do you go to when you have issues in your teaching? Do you go to each other? Do you go to uh, someone above you, you know, the chair of your department or a mentor of some sort, right? One big thing that has always worked well for me is to find a group of peers that I feel like I can bounce ideas off of. This is especially true in my psychology world as I'm doing therapy and things like that. Um, I don't know everything. I, I, don't you know, I don't envision that I ever will know everything, but I do know people who are experts or at least have had experiences that I haven't had. So one of the best things you could do is start building that village. If you don't have it already, start building it up as best you can. And we're members of the Teaching and Learning Commons, which is a peer support group university-wide. So we're not sort of tied to any one department or school or college even. And so you can contact us or contact the Teaching and Learning Commons if you search for it on the WVU website and they can give you access to a teacher. Um, and a lot of times people don't want to deal with their issue within their department because it might be a little touchy. So it's a good sort of objective ear to, to call upon in the teaching and learning commons. And we give advice and counsel and just an ear, like I said, um, on things like uh, classroom management, which we're sort of talking about today, but also things like how to improve your uh, student evaluations of instruction, how to um, improve your syllabus, uh, what happens if you have, you know, sort of a bad, uh, a bad semester, that sort of thing. So don't hesitate to contact us because we're, we're sort of associates uh, for the year and we love helping other teachers, especially um, those that, you know, know enough to reach out for help. That's the smart teachers we like to work with. Absolutely. So the next point on here, creativity, right? Sometimes I feel like in a course, especially like 191, where there's, there's a lot of expectations. There's a lot of things that you need to check the box for from the start of the semester to the end of the semester. I know that's true for a lot of our lower level classes, a lot of our GECs. Sometimes hard to be creative or to at least feel like you have the freedom to be creative. But I'm hoping that we can give you some ideas of how you can put yourself and your creative ideas into your course as you're building it, because not only will it make it more fun for you to teach, it will also likely result in some more buy-in from the students that you have sitting in front of you. If they have a reason to be there, they have a why, oftentimes you get a better result and it makes your job easier because they are more invested. So creativity is your friend. It's a little scary sometimes 
But hopefully, we can open that door a little bit and, and talk about some ideas there. And you might have expected me from the College of Creative Arts to talk about creativity, but Stephanie brought it up because creativity is discipline neutral. Everybody needs creativity in their work. You know, if you're generating a new experiment or a new hypothesis, you have to be creative, otherwise you're gonna do what everybody else has done. Or if you're trying to build a better bridge, you have to be creative. So everybody needs to use that spark of creativity in their disciplines. I just do it more, you know, openly and overtly. However, one of the cool things about the creative mind is that you have that uh, ability to empathize with what the students are going through. And just a little thought experiment right now. You're about to embark on a 191 class. I can guarantee you that none of your students came to WVU to major in 191, right? They probably came here thinking they're gonna be engineers or doctors or lawyers or French teachers or whatever. So the same approach you take to something like this where we're asking you why are you being trained they might be asking that same question. Why am I in this class? I've been going to school for 12 years. I know how to go to school. You, you know that mindset? Well, there's a big difference between high school and college, and we're gonna get to some of those finer points in our presentation. But just realize that creativity means putting yourself in their space or their place. And that becomes a very important model for what you're doing to, for them in the class. You're showing them what active learning might be, or what obsessive curiosity, one of my favorite expressions is. You know, uh, if I don't know an answer, Stephanie said she didn't know everything, I can concur, I don't know everything. Together, we probably know a lot. But with Google, which every one of your students probably has pulled up on their you know, phone when you start your class, if you don't know something, say, oh, wait, where was Lurch from the Adams Family TV show Born? Oh, that's right, he was born in Weirton, West Virginia. Thank you for that. So, you know, in the course of my lecture, I might bring up an example and then run into a brick wall when I can't remember a point. So I say, look that up. So I'm modeling for them. Look it up. You don't have to know everything. You just have to know where to find everything. That's one of my mottos. So um, creativity means being flexible on the fly adapting to what they're needing and wanting, and we're gonna get to that a lot in the next bit. So problem solving? Yeah, that last bit of problem solving, we're hoping to thread that through the rest of this. That, that's a big part of classroom management, right? There's oftentimes things that, maybe from semester to, me to, se to semester, are not the same, right? You, you go in and you teach for a semester and you think, okay, I, I got this now, I figured it out. And the next cohort of students you have come in, they're just, they're different in some way, right? And, and figuring out how to manage that on the fly is a little intimidating sometimes. So we're hoping to give you some ideas of how to perhaps work through some of those issues that you might encounter in your classroom. So on that note, some best practices. And I'm sure there are lots of lists that you can find on this. And this is just a very, very small tip of the iceberg um, you know, commentary from, from our expertise. But I'm going to start with this uh, develop rapport comment. I encounter this every single day with my therapy clients because if someone is approaching me and saying, okay, I have this issue and I need some help with it, right? Basically from, from minute number one, I need to begin to establish trust with that person or they will not trust me and they will not share openly. They will not take what I have to offer and assume that it has some validity to it, right? It becomes this challenging balance until you've established trust. But sometimes rapport can feel a lot like a friendship it, as we're treading, you know, especially newer instructors, you know, graduate students and such, when they, they most recently were undergraduate students, they're just recently transitioned it's sometimes hard to draw those lines and it's, there's a lot of gray area. So how do we develop rapport? Listening is really your best friend at first, okay? Observing, taking a step back and saying, who am I dealing with? What is it that they need? What is it that they want? And we're gonna get into that quite a bit more um, on the next slide. 
And how can I manage that in some way? And how can I show them that I'm on the same page? I am there as a support person, not there to judge them in some way, right? Yeah, the, uh, the, the whole idea of this establishment of the rapport uh, is important in a class where uh, it's almost uh, randomized how your students show up. You're not getting all people in your, dis or, or maybe you are, maybe some of your sections are dedicated to your majors or future majors. Well, that's, that's an advantage. And so your experience as a professor in that area, they're more likely to listen to you uh, if they think that you are going to give them advice that will help them in that narrow path. However, it doesn't mean that if you're teaching to a generalized audience, you really have to do anything very much different for the individual students. Because you have an experience that they are coveting, right? Getting the degree, getting the, uh, the life experience that comes with, with uh, having gone through it before. So that's a, a great way of developing that rapport. And it also leads to, as I sort of broached the subject earlier, active learning. Uh, there's a great deal to be gained from teaching them that they are not going to be handed everything the way high school did, right? In high school, they would say, read chapter 10 in the history book. There'd be a quiz on chapter 10. They do well or not do well. Now read chapter 12 or 11. And, and it becomes, uh, you know, are you learning is a big question. So a lot of times assignments in college are challenging them to be uh, sort of apprentice scholars in a way, instead of just being the receiving end of a, uh, a bunch of information or trivia or whatever you want to label it as. The whole idea of asking them to come up with their own questions or research interests or um, you know that, that idea of problem solving sounds negative, but it's really a part of a lot of disciplines. So to teach them to frame questions, to frame problems so that they can be solved. Uh, the idea of what a, a discovered problem is and a set problem, do you all know those, those differences? This is something I, I learned from a colleague when I team taught in the Honors College. Um, a discovered problem is something like, how can I arrange these instruments in the musical form to sound like a rodeo. That's something that I came up with on my own, and there's no real answer to that. I just have to try. But a set problem is, you know, find the perimeter of a rectangle. There's a formula, you plug it in. The set problem is a lot less demanding on the creative or demanding on the individual's input. So problem solving is a great way to increase their active learning. So even if it's something that you know cold, it's not a problem to you, it may be still a problem to them, like time management or uh, note taking, things like that. Those are things that you can actually help if you discern your, your class, you, that one section needs help in one area or another, and we're gonna get to that again. Um, you wanna start with- And obviously, Virginia? as oh, yes. as you, just, just to kind of mm -hmm. piggyback on that, as you develop your syllabus, right, you're, you're developing different assignments, you're, you're requesting of your students, figuring out how that ties into their active learning and then also tying it into their why. They should have a purpose behind doing that. That is gonna help you with behavior management significantly in the classroom. So if you have a student that comes up to you and says, you know what, this assignment is really stupid. I don't wanna do this assignment. It serves no purpose in my life whatsoever. You might be thinking, yeah, you're probably right if you just look at it on the surface. But if we pick apart the assignment just a little bit, is there maybe one thing, maybe two things that you can broaden the student's vision of that assignment to say, okay, if you can do this well, what's not to say you can't do that well in the next course that you take, right? It, it, it's sometimes not only about 191. Sometimes we need to help the students look forward and ahead, maybe to other courses, other, objective, other objectives that they have in their lives because that's where the behavior management stuff can get a little bit sticky. If the students are not invested, it's very hard to get them to be successful. And, yeah. and we don't really have secrets as far as why you're doing something. There's no shame in saying, I'm giving you this assignment because I wanna make sure everybody has this skill. You may assume you have the skill, 
show me and we can move on. There's no, there's no curtain that you hide you know, the secrets of teaching behind and then you only pull out one or two things when needed. Let them know, this is what teachers do. I remember the first day I ever taught, I, I stood in front of my class of high school students in New Orleans and I was an actor and I had never taken an education course. So I asked myself, what would a teacher say in this situation? And I said, sit down. And they all sat down. And I went, ooh, it works. <laughs> Teaching works. Um, so it's sort of like what King Lear said, you know, even a dog is obeyed in office, you know, when he barks at the guy walking by the yard. Um, anyway. Um, so with the next comment then, being genuine, sometimes finding your genuine can, can be a little difficult initially, right? I know in the therapeutic world, we share a little bit, but not too much. We need to connect with people. We need to, to have them understand that we understand them. But again, we don't want to be buddies with them, right? So I think Jay had a really fantastic idea about this, that your story doesn't always have to really be the absolute honest truth. Sometimes you need to find ways to connect in a very genuine way. You care about them. You want them to be successful but in a way that they can understand and in a way that they can attach with what you're trying to get from them. Yeah, it's sort of that old Hollywood saying, uh, the toughest thing is sincerity, and if you can fake that, you got it made. Uh, so the idea of telling students something, it doesn't have to be what actually happened to you. You can invent an experience that illustrates exactly what you want them to hear, and that way you're safe because you're not really divulging who you are or, or what happened to your you know, dog in the third grade or whatever, but it illustrates a point and, and then you move on. So if, if they think it happened to you, they may listen more closely as opposed to here's a case study from you know, Alaska or something. Just a thought. Uh, the, the genuine quality though is something that a lot of them pick up on. You know, they, they really want to believe that you have their best interests at heart. So, um, you know, you can do everything to foster that, you know, without overstepping those boundaries. Um, and we, I think we already said this a couple of times. It's okay not to know. Uh, again, but that offers the opportunity to model what do you do when you don't know something. There's a great button, Ask a Librarian. Do you know that on our website, on our library's homepage? Ask a Librarian. Who knew? It's great. Show that to the students and say, look, when you need help, there's always someone around to help. You just may not know which button to push or what number to dial. You know, IT is 293-4444. That's a number you memorize quickly when you have to get your keyboard working again or, you know, the, your, your credentials don't log you in. Students don't know that number off the top of their head immediately, but it's one of the most valuable things, especially if they're dealing with e-campus problems. So, you know, asking for help, saying, I don't know the answer to this, let's find out together, is a great, again, it's a great uh, skill to foster in them. And as you develop that report, it should empower you as an instructor for this course. And that's really what our objective is in this kind of chat, is try to have you walk out of this room feeling like, okay, I feel ready. I feel like I have something a little bit more in my tool belt or you know, in my little bag of magic dust, or whatever you want to call it, uh, to pull from. Okay, So here's where I think Jay and I are in agreement that this is where the meat and bones of it is. Um, students come to you, or come to WVU, and they say, this is, this is what I want. This is what I want to get out of my university experience. right?" Sometimes it's not always academic, and we all know that. Um, but trying to find out what that is and how we can make it manageable within the classroom is very, very important. Does it match what they need? And this is where we oftentimes run into some problems because we as instructors have a very good idea of what we need them to accomplish in a semester, right? Going back to that initial point I made, you have a lot of boxes to check. You have a lot of things that you need to get through in a semester in order to say, yes, I did my job. If you were to walk through each of those steps with each and every student that you have, would they agree with you that they needed all of that? It's your job to figure out a way to have each and every student understand elements 
of each part of this 191 experience that they do need. And that's not always easy. And, you know, 191 sounds like an umbrella term, but it's made up of individual skills, mm -hmm. like advising, for instance. That's a perfect illustration of want and need, right? None of our curricula here say 128 hours of electives, do they? There's a set pattern of things that they need, and it's part of our job to inform them and make sure that they understand that this course is a prerequisite to that course, or that this course is only taught in the fall, you better get it now, or don't you dare drop a course without considering these things or coming to me. You know, there, there's a whole set of things that they think, well, I got this covered, I know what courses are, I know what I want, but they can really screw up their eight semesters here if they drop a course unnecessarily or take a course out of order or change majors without doing the right paperwork. There's all sorts of things that you can help them when they don't even know what they need. They just know what they want. And so marrying those two things, I said the other day that the trick for our purposes is to make that center overlap area as large as possible so that they feel like they're getting what they want when they're getting what they need. I, I think that's the simplest and, and cleanest answer for that. And it's probably going to keep the peace a lot longer in their minds, less stress, that sort of thing. Absolutely. So how do we get to making that center portion bigger and bigger and bigger? There are all these components that you have the option to be creative with, right? To kind of put your own stamp on. Uh, your syllabi is, is one big part of that, right? You, you give your students a contract, essentially, right at the beginning of the semester and say, these are all of the assignments, homework, extra credit opportunities, your schedule, that sort of thing. And it's all in there. But when you're presenting your schedule, or I'm sorry, your syllabi to your students, how do you do that in your classroom? Is it a discussion? Is it a lecture? Is it you just hand them a piece of paper and say... You can read? Yeah, read it. <laughs> that, right there in the beginning of your semester, at the beginning of that first class, really does set the stage in a lot of ways for what your expectations are for your students. Yes? So true, yes, you can give them their, their syllabus and they can read it. I'm sure they're all very capable of doing that. But how is it different if you were to have it to be a bit more interactive? And one of, the, one of the things you can do when you're handing out the syllabus is keep in mind a sort of a universal uh, categorical imperative of how would I like them to approach all the syllabi that they get in all their classes. You can make up for what another teacher in another class doesn't do with the syllabus by showing them how to take the syllabus and make use of it. So if you look at the back side of that handout, there's a random page I pulled from the syllabus for 191. And you see it's got a lot of topics. Some of them are ex expanded upon, some of them are just a list of grade rubrics, that sort of thing. But as I said before, there's no reason to have a curtain up between what you want pedagogically and what they hear. So explain to them. I put this paragraph in here for this reason. A lot of students ignore this, but it's at their peril. Or notice the language here. It's very well chosen because it makes it incumbent upon everyone in the class and not just the students to do something or not just for me to do something, but it's a, it's a state of being for the whole sort of the social justice or the inclus inclusivity of the whole class is a joint effort. It's not just you have to be nice to each other, right? It's we're all in this together. So a lot of what the syllabus says is idealistic, but that's a great reason to point it out that we are being idealistic because this is achievable and this is what makes a learning community operate, you know, effectively. Uh, and so those expectations, the higher your expectations, the more likely more students are, are going to try to meet them. Low expectations render low results. I mean, there's no, I mean, I've, I've been teaching for many years and that's what I've noticed. And, and I've had parents who find me 
at Best Buy and, you know, Giant Eagle, and they go, you taught my son. He said it was the hardest class he ever had, but he learned so much, and he loved the subject after he got out. And I mean, that's one of the nicest things you can hear as a teacher, that you were rigorous but effective, and you kept the, the sort of the love of learning going on. That starts with the syllabus, I think, because the topics you cover are not just preordained by the powers that be here. They are something that you manifestly find important to impart to the students. If you didn't find them important, you wouldn't be teaching them. And when I taught 191, they came in and they said, is this busy work? And I said, it can be. You might hear that rumor you know, at a party, you might say, oh, 191, that's a blow-off class, nobody learns anything. Don't let it be that. And say to them, I'm not going to let this class fall under your feet. We're going to raise this class up so it's useful, and you will, you will remember this, the skills and the tools you learn here in every future class you take. That's the sort of the bargain I make with you. If we make it useful, it'll be useful for your life. Things like time management. It's a pretty huge opportunity, yeah, right? Absolutely. I mean, if you think about it that way, you are getting these students when they are raw, right? They're coming in from their high school experience. Three months removed from there's, high school. There's a lot that can be learned. So it's really about setting the stage properly. So thinking about that management of expectations, about what they're going to be able to utilize in the future, right, as they're walking away from this course. Time management is one really big aspect where you can have a pretty significant impact. Yes. If we think about the students who are making their way into their later years of their college career, usually that is where they're struggling most, right? Well, I need to work, and I need to socialize, and I need to do this, and I need to do that. And oftentimes what happens is the academic stuff tends to get pushed back further and further and further. Whereas if they manage their time well, or at least learn some strategies that work for them early on, this is something that they can carry into adulthood, yeah. right? So understanding that if you have a student who's walking in late to class every you know, couple of days, let's say, or, or every day for that matter, do you let it slide? Do you call them out? What do you do? Pointing out to that student, not necessarily calling them out in front of the whole class, but you can kind of manage that as you see fit. But Oftentimes, I end up using open-ended questions as best I possibly can. So and using that as an example of a student who walks into your classroom late, hey, Joe, planning on getting a job after you graduate? Yeah? Okay. Um, so when you have a job, do they have expectations of, like, you have to show up at a certain time? Well, yeah. Okay. H how are you doing practicing that with this course? Right? Just trying to make connections. It's not just to show up. That's not the purpose of your course. The purpose is to practice these behaviors that they are going to need in order to be successful later in life. And sometimes a little bit of humor, right? A little bit of connection to say, you know what? Yeah, I had a job when I was 18 and I wasn't showing up every day. And guess what? I didn't get paid anymore, right? It's kind of, kind of making it clear to the student that you have a purpose in calling them out. You have a purpose in having them be there on time. Can even go a step further and work through some of that time management with the class as a whole. And obviously every cohort's a little different, but as you hand them the syllabus, how are those assignments that they're expected to do, the big ones, the small ones, going to fit into their semester? Do they have a planner? Do they have a calendar that they use? Do they just enter it into their you know, iPhone? H how are they utilizing some sort of time management skill? And how can you help them take the assignments that you have given them on the syllabus and put them into whatever management style that they're using? And, and please invite them to bring syllabi from every other class and overlay them. What better example of time management need is there when you have five classes or six and all the weeks line up, right? We start classes on the same week and we end classes. So where are the term papers due? Where are the tests? Who has weekly quizzes, who doesn't? Um, you know, where does spring break fall for this class? Do I have uh, something due before spring break or after? 
you know, there's, there's very little time after Thanksgiving. You can point that out to new students because it's really a shock to the system when you come back and you have one week of class and then exams and you're like, wait, hold on, what happened? Uh, so make sure that their time management is not just for 191, although it's a perfect laboratory for that, but it's much more effective, I think, if you broaden that to all their classes and have them, that could be an individual assignment. Show me a calendar, Google Calendar, iCalendar, eCampus Calendar, however they want to lay it out. Show, show me your syllabi presented, color-coded, however you want to do it, be creative. Make that worth 10%. You know, show them it's important. And tell them, you can build into your week work schedule, video game schedule, you're going to the football game. All those things take time and should be accounted for. This is just reality. And, and again, that's one of the great uses of 191. I'm teaching you the real world instead of, you know, sort of the expectations of every one of your teachers that you're going to devote your whole week to this one class. That's not going to happen, and they know that. So manage it skillfully, and it'll take care of itself. It can be done, and that's how you lessen the stress again. And it also helps your objective, right? You've laid clear expectations. You've said, I understand that time management is very important. Because how often do we have students, I don't want to say never, but it's less often that we have students coming up to us weeks ahead of time. So you know, I know this assignment's coming up. I think I have a lot happening right around the time of that assignment. Can you help me manage my time so that I can ensure I get that done? Versus, the assignment was due yesterday. Oh, I completely forgot that that was on the syllabus, right? Asking for forgiveness after the fact versus asking for assistance before the fact. The first, right, you're going to get into some trouble if, you're, if you end up being late and then not, not getting the assistance you need. Whereas Asking for assistance before the fact, that shows initiative, that shows forethought. Those are good yeah. adult skills to have, right? So kind of showing them, I'm on your side. I want to help you. I want to be an advocate and an asset for you. Here's how you can best utilize that. And keep up that rapport with the teacher. Oh, ab by absolutely. Coming early. You know, I, I sometimes joke that I put on my syllabus an A equals one to two excuses a semester. A B is three to four excuses, C is five to six excuses. A students find a way to get things done. And you just tell that to the students. It's not, it's not that everybody in the front row here is going to get an A and everybody in the back is going to get C's or worse, but that's going to happen. But you tell them that you should apply your energies to make sure that you get things done. Find a way to get that paper printed out if your dorm printer is out of toner or if you don't have any money on your card. Find a way. This is the creative end of it, but it's also the real world. If you have a job in the adult sector and they say you're giving a presentation and you show up without the presentation and say, I didn't have a thumb drive. I'm so sorry. Uh, what are we doing today? We're merging with a multinational Swiss, co oh, well, you know, I'm so sorry. I didn't, uh, I can have it next week. Um, do I lose points? Do, do, you know, it doesn't work like that. Um, but again, time management is, is big. And mentorship is, you know, that's your baby. So Right, that's, that's a primary role that you serve in this instructor position that you hold, right? You have interaction with these students right from the get-go. So you have the ability to connect with them in a way that they can say, yeah, that, that's where I want to be. That's what I want to do. That's how I want to learn. And it just is a matter of finding your footing of what does each student connect to. I'm going to go into it, I, th I think, in the next slide a little bit more. But I often use motivational interviewing, right? So I use it in therapy, but I also use it quite a bit in, um, in the classroom as well as, as a means of mentorship. Rather than saying, do this, don't do that, or yes or no questions. I'm opening the floor to say, no, I really do want to hear what you have to say, and I want to listen to you in a non-judgmental way so that I can best help you. But again, there's always that fine line between how much do we kind of throw that lifeline out there for those students who struggle, and how much are we actually enabling some of those poor behaviors that they engage in by being late and things, right? So again, 
I think with mentorship, there's, there's management on our side as well. We have to be careful that um, even though we care, we should always care, of course, uh, we, we can help too much sometimes, and that actually enables students to continue with some of those poor behaviors. Yeah. One of the easiest ways to point out mentorship and the ability and the resource is office hours, right? Everybody's got office hours. They're right there on the syllabus. Mine are such and such a date and time, such and such a date and time, and by appointment. And I stress to them, and by appointment means, yeah, you make an appointment with me, I'll be there. This is part of what your tuition money pays for. So don't think I'm just paying lip service to office hours as what teachers have to do, or this is where I might be at a certain time. No, this is when you can come with problems outside of class. It, it sure beats emails at 2 a.m., trust me. And come see me, even if it's not about 191. If you're having trouble with your French class, come talk to me. I may have advice that'll save your grade there. I may know somebody you can talk to, you know, if you're not getting what you, you need out of that class. Just come see me. We could talk about the last movie you saw if you want. I mean, I, 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 obviously I teach in a discipline that, that lends itself to you know, everybody sort of enjoying the arts. But you know, if you're, a, if you're an engineering teacher and somebody comes to you and says, you know, I love engineering, I just I can't do calculus. That's gonna be an issue that you need to solve before you get somewhere. So whatever you're talking about, you know, hey, have you, you know, if you're an engineering, if you're a civil engineer and somebody comes to you and says, should I take a year abroad? That's a great question that you're liable to hear in almost any discipline, right? Should I, should I travel? Absolutely. You're gonna learn so much about yourself in that, but also you can see the great bridges of the world or the great towers, you know. There's all sorts of things you can sort of individualize in office hours. So don't overlook that as an opportunity for mentorship on a one-to-one -one basis. And the last point up there, questions and concerns. Obviously, students have different ways of communicating with you. Office hours, hopefully, is, is one of them, the major ways that they connect with you. But every now and then, you're going to have students who raise their hand, or perhaps not, in a classroom and say, you know what? Fill in complaint here. <laughs> you know, and, and they voice their, their opinions loudly and, and perhaps not so kindly. And it puts you in an awkward position as an instructor, right? So how do we manage behavior of students that maybe is unprofessional, that we don't really want to call them out for that in, in the whole group. Um, so I kind of put that up there just as a, I, I wanted to share some ideas that have worked for me in the past, but um, sometimes calling upon their peers to be the ones that respond to poor behavior in the classroom is one of the best ways that you can do that. Not in a cruel way, but for an example, you know, someone's like, ooh, you know, this assignment's terrible. I think, you know, the worst assignment I've ever had. I don't think I want to do it, this and that, you know. And um, start call oh, does, does everybody feel that way? Let, let's get some, some other feedback, right? So it almost calms the situation down a little bit, and it takes you out of the hot spotlight um, because in 191, you have a fairly large group, and you start to learn, you know, who, who are those students you can rely on a little bit. So sometimes utilizing them to help you could be a good technique in the classroom. Also, just kind of opening the floor to this point, do we have questions from anybody yet? We're doing okay? Okay. So, expertise. I know I'm no eCampus expert. It is not my friend sometimes. I, I, we have a great um, person in our department that helps us, but there are errors sometimes. Sometimes it's errors that I make. It happens. Sometimes it's the system, right? How, how do we manage that? You're going to have students who maybe are even less technologically adept, believe it or not, than you, you are. It's, it's possible, right? Um, or they're more technologically uh, savvy than you are. So they're seeing things that you don't see. So who do you go to for help? Who do you go to for expertise in eCampus? Hopefully you know someone in your department that is a good connection. Yes, we all know people in our departments, hopefully. Okay. My, my take on eCampus is that um, they're going to need it for all their career here. You know, it's not just a skill for 191. And uh, 
there's a lot you can do with eCampus that you may not realize. So they're offering um, next week, I believe it is, a couple of eCampus 101 sessions. If you're wanting to dip your big toe into eCampus a little more, you may want to take advantage of that training uh, to get you know close up and personal uh, information about eCampus, the potential um, uses of it, and you can ask your question uh, right there with the experts. Um, but again, it's something that they need to know how to use themselves, and it's incumbent upon them to learn it as well as possible. One of the points I always make with eCampus is, if you're taking a test online from your house, don't do it on your phone. <laughs> Please, at least get a laptop. And what's best is to use a, you know, if I'm taking the final exam, I'm using a wired LAN connection. I'm, I'm going to the library and plugging into a network. I'm not re relying on Wi-Fi at Buffalo Wild Wings for my final exam. Things like that, they don't think about that. And then you get a, you know, an email or a call or something during the exam saying, uh, I, it just dropped away, I don't know what to do. It's like, well, here's what you do. You build a time machine, you go back, and you make good decisions, okay? That, sorry, that's too sarcastic, but. <laughs> so, so um, as far as advising, and I know we, we've talked about this a lot um, to this point, just I want to go back to the, the motivational interviewing stuff just for a minute. Um, as a student comes to your office, to your office hours to talk about class, maybe approaches you after class, you are not necessarily the end-all be-all expert of everything that they need to know, right? We've already said that, that there's a lot of resources and we're going to go through some of those that you can direct them to, to help answer those questions. But to best understand what resources they need, those open-ended questions can be very, very helpful for you. So if a student comes up to you and says, you know, I'm, just having, I'm really struggling this semester, I'm having a really hard time getting my assignments done, right? Some open-ended questions such as, okay, is this, you know, is this a new experience for you or have, have you had trouble up until this point? Did you have trouble in high school, right? So trying to understand, is it accommodations that they need? And should they then seek help at the Carruth Center or at the Quinn Curtis Center to get some testing done, right? You might just assume maybe they're a poor student, but it might actually mean that they need some accommodation. So it's really trying to understand the problem better. Um, or perhaps, you know, hey, I'm struggling a lot this semester and I'm just not getting my assignments done. Okay, well, is there anything else going on in life that maybe is taking up a lot more time than you thought it would? Oh, well, yeah, I go out every night with my friend, right? So sometimes it, it seems so obvious to us that there's something else going on, but the students don't see it. So just by asking those questions, you're starting to light a light bulb in their brain that might not have been firing prior to that conversation, right? Yes, you're the one that assesses them and gives them a grade. You are the one that says, yes, you passed or no, you didn't pass, sure. But what else are you providing them, right? Hopefully, you're not then shuffling them off to their next instructor to say, okay, now you deal with them. Because we see that a lot in primary and secondary education, right? Especially in areas where they don't have some really, really great teachers that see these things. Now we have a lot more training, we have a lot better understanding. So just by asking some open-ended questions, which just basically means not yes or no, you're seeking more information uh, about their lived experience, it can help you in the advising sector. Mm -hmm. Yeah, e even a, a simple question like, how, do you, how are you gonna use this degree? That can actually help with which electives and which GEFs they're gonna take. I mean, that's pretty self-evident to us, but it may not be to them. Uh, so resources in general, though, there are a lot more. The library, as I mentioned, has a lot of resources available to them. Uh, do you know that there's a lot of DVDs you can check out at the library? Like great films, foreign films, and, and it's just like free movies. I tell the students, go to the downtown campus and just browse the, the DVD shelves. At least it gets them in the library, right? And then they might discover that there are these like hardcover things that with pages and like... I don't know, manual, you know, tablets? It's just weird. Um, there's the, the Carruth Center. Uh, you can probably speak to that. Yeah, Carruth and the Quinn Curtis Center. Obviously, if students are coming from high school and maybe everything was handed to them, as Jay suggested earlier, you know, it, it was very easy for them. And all of a sudden, they're coming into an environment where they're being challenged a little bit more. There's a lot more distractions. Um, they might need some help in managing that, and sometimes a chat with their instructor or their roommate isn't gonna be enough 
they need a little bit more. Um, the writing center, right? And I know we always put like a little blurb in our syllabus or mention it, but I think it's something that's underutilized and maybe that's actually good to tap into under the time management conversation. Say, so all right, you have a pretty big writing assignment due at the end of the semester. How many of you feel like you are really talented, gifted writers, you know, and you're not likely to get a ton of hands in the air? Okay, well, guess what? If you write your paper a few weeks ahead of time, you can hand it over to these expert people who will read it for you and give you feedback. <gasps> right? Sometimes they don't even realize that that is available to them. I learned in my research that we actually have a system here on campus where they will do transcription for research. So if you do interviews, they will transcribe it for you. I could have sat there and I could have typed out all of my interviews or I could use a service that does transcript. See, it's, it's resources you don't even know. Is there a fee for that? Uh, minimal. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in that. <laughs> See, we have to learn what resources we have. And, and as far as like the writing center goes, a lot of the dorms have set schedules where they bring in tutors mm -hmm. for calc or chem or bio. So ask the students, do you know what the tutoring schedule is at your dorm? That's a great conversation to have. And if they don't know it, make that a scavenger hunt, right? Or part of a scavenger hunt. Go find this resource. What's the address of the Carruth Center? What's the no phone number for IT? Those are all great questions that they can um, learn by sort of sending the tentacles out and figuring out what's what. Uh, the Writing Center, uh, having a roommate read your paper, because a lot of times you know this from your own writing. You're so close to it. You skip over that typo every time, but your roommate may catch, oh, you wrote form here, but you mean from. And spell check won't catch that because from is a word. Another pair of eyes is always a helpful resource. So on that note, questions. Yeah, so again, these are just some little tips and tricks that we've encountered over time. Anybody have a Green question? Green, red, Any blue yellow. questions out there? Blue and gold. Blue and gold, yeah, <laughs> blue and gold, blue and gold. Um, so your students are coming at you from a lot of different backgrounds and experiences, so it may be important for you to um, do a really important inventory early, and that'll help you, I think, get off on the best foot. Because if you don't get to know where they're coming from, their needs and wants, um, you're not going to be able to tailor your syllabus to exactly this section that you're teaching. So that's my big advice is to, you know, come in with a syllabus that's three quarters of the way baked, right? Or it needs icing and the icing on that is what the students say they need. You know, hey, I, I've always had trouble with um, waking up on time. Can you, you know, I mean, you may hear the weirdest questions, but they're important to the students. There's something that the students are dealing with. I always say, set three alarms. Set one on the far side of the room, you know. And I think one great thing you mentioned last time that didn't come up this time, um, as you're working through the syllabus, this is just kind of one last little thought, um, to make it interactive, you can actually have the students write down questions, comments, things they have, and you can collect them, you know. Oh. And then, What's on those papers? That, that's an investment from the students. But when you're reading them, they don't know what's on the paper. So you might say, others. oh, people, people want to know what, what sort of active learning options we're going to have in this class. That's a great question. Oh, and here's someone who's might not really actually important. It, it's important to this person to know about libraries. Good, that's on the syllabus already. And then they'll go, wow, how did this teacher know what we were going to need help with so well that it's already printed on the syllabus? Genius. Genius. <laughs> and like I said, no, I, I, I wrote down what's the best way to, best place to park for football games. Nobody helped me with that. You shouldn't have a car. Anyway, <laughs> uh, don't drive in Morgantown on game day. That's yeah. the best advice. Any, any questions? questions? Any, um, you want to throw something at us to challenge us? Experiences you've had that you're like, oh, that was a really tough one. Nothing. You know, one of my favorite time management things, just to add to the conversation. I was never more organized than when I was in a play. You know, because my nights were taken up with rehearsals and I knew I didn't have a lot of time to bum around. So that's something that taught me time management was having no extra time. 
and I forced my mind to organize. Whereas, you know, these students, if they come and they, they have, you know, 15 hours a week in class and they don't really think about homework, they think there's a lot of hours in the week I can play video games or I can, you know, go to Cooper's Rock and, and meditate, you know. I can do almost anything I want because mom and dad aren't watching me. I can eat anything I want. I can have tacos every meal if I want, you know. And that becomes then a, an issue where you want to talk to them about sort of gaining, <laughs> y'all have tacos every meal? Yeah, it's it, dollar tacos tonight um, at Trivia at Crockett's. But anyway, um, <laughs> I'll see you there. Um, the, the whole idea of, of your experience is in some ways saying, don't make the mistakes I made, or I've lived through this, let me tell you a secret. You know, this, this whole idea of um, sort of getting, getting that mentoring going, sometimes I, I treat the students like, here's, here's a cheat, right? You can take your paper to the writing center and they'll go over it for you. So don't treat it as, here are the resources available to all students for the fees you paid. No, say, look, you want to get away with something? Go to the writing center and they'll help you with your paper. Or, do you know, you push the buttons in the calculator in the right way, you get the answer right there in front of them. So again, if they think they're getting away with extra credit, they don't think of it as extra work. They think of it as extra credit. Hey, you want to get an A in this class? Do all the work and the extra credit. You're set. If, yeah, if they think that, you know, I mean, they, they're looking for those cheat books for their video games, you know, Donkey Drop or whatever, whatever game they're playing this week. You know, it's like, oh, look, there's a new book and I can, I can jump up a level. Here. Well, say, look, you can jump up a level from C to B by doing this, right? Here's a, here's a, here's a, uh, a great shortcut. So that's, again, this is, again, it might sound like manipulating the students. You know, telling them a story that's not actually factually true, but it illustrates. Yeah, we're manipulating the students, but that's our job, is to get them to change their behaviors. And that's what the definition of learning is, isn't it? Changing their behaviors. So we hope you have a semester that's going to be filled with students who take everything to heart and apply everything you've suggested. And the results make them smile when they come at the end of the semester and say, not only did I get an A in your class, but I got an A in every other class because I was so damned organized that it made this semester seem doable and I did it. And that's all you, you, you need to know. And we'd like to think that utilizing some of these tricks, these tips, or things that you guys talk about will make this easier semester to semester. So you see what works, you see what doesn't work. I know a big thing for me, and this is pulling thing out of my, my parenting book, that oftentimes if I'm teaching, well, I guess fall or spring, well, fall break is scheduled for a certain time, spring break, okay, I know most of you are thinking you're not gonna come to class on Thursday because it's spring break. Well, guess what, right? You, you, you basically tell them you're reading their minds. They say, oh, well, now she knows. Yeah, I guess I better know. show up <laughs> or I'm gonna get caught. So, um, you know, utilizing things in your life that help the students connect with you, help you maintain control of your classroom, but in a way that helps the students be successful so that your job is easier. Yeah. It's ultimately our job. And just like yeah. with a writer, everything is material. With a teacher in a 191 class, everything is germane to a 191 class. Because every problem they have in every other class or commuting or, or whatever, it all is about success in college. And that's the name of the game in 191. So don't treat it as off topic necessarily if they bring up something. Try to find which subheading on your syllabus it applies to, right? Oh, you have trouble with your roommate, right? That's a pretty, well, then you know you need to go to your RA first and you need to, you know, there's, there's protocols. But just having them say, I hate my roommate in the middle of a class is not going to solve anybody's problems, but it is a teachable moment because it says use your resources, use the chain of command and, and you know, work it out with the right, you know, the right uh, steps. So anyway, we can go questions? on and on, but and, any yeah. other questions? Uh, uh, as if they had any questions. No, Did you notice talking. that? I said, any <laughs> other questions? Like y'all had, y'all said anything this hour. 
Thank you all for being Thank so quiet you. that you didn't compete with the microphones. That was very thoughtful of all of you. Do you have any questions to Not repeat? to make any noise with the laughter or the applause or anything. Thanks.